Hey, thank you for making it. We are about to start. Thank you so much for being patient with this super complex organization. Okay, uh, we have to use the time because we cannot go over time. Therefore, there will be like we are starting precisely now. So uh, bear with me and please mute yourselves unless you speak, but do unmute when you speak and also use video if only possible, at least when you speak, okay? Good evening to everybody in my time zone. Uh, good afternoon or morning to others. I do hope uh, you can at least hear and see us. I do regret that we are doing this event online, but we take what we have. Uh, my name is Katarzyna Szemielewicz. Uh, I'm a co-host uh, of, of, of this session, which will be uh, in, in which we, we will certainly uh, go deep and discuss uh, hard questions around AI explainability. Uh, I'm happy not to be alone uh, in this role. Uh, my co-host, Fanny, can you answer yourself? Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Today, um, it's it's an odd day, but I'm glad that we can have this conversation. Um, my name is Fanny. I work as Euro Policy Manager at Access Now, and um, I'm very glad that uh, we are together. Kasha, I'll hand it back to you, and we can continue. My organization, Panopticon Foundation, is also um, a formal host of this session. I hope you will find time uh, after the session to, to check more about our work. I will not waste precious time we have today with our speakers for a further uh, introduction. Um, the plan we have is ambitious. Uh, what we hope to discuss uh, is uh, I, I did this, this short list to, to, to help you follow, follow our plan, but uh, important caveat, the, the plan will change according to what our speakers bring and what uh, you also bring uh, in the open discussion. Fanny will explain both parts of the session uh, in a minute. Let me now only reinforce uh, why this topic and how we want to lead you through this uh, huge emerging topic. Uh, maybe needless to say why, I mean, simply AI uh, is in every fridge today, but not in every fridge, not only in every fridge, it is also presented uh, increasingly as the solution for complex societal problems, including in the context of fighting uh, the pandemic and in many other very serious uh, contexts like crime prevention, uh, or managing uh, social welfare, um, assisting healthcare, um, and, 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 and so on. Uh, it is in this context that we see an urging need uh, for not only conversation, but practical solutions around AI accountability. And one of the solutions uh, being discussed, at least in our European digital rights bubble for a while, is uh, pushing for explainability. Uh, is this, this, this expectation that at least uh, impactful AI systems that have real impact on individuals and society will be explainable. Because if we have a black box that we cannot control, we also cannot keep it accountable. That is one of the uh, presumptions that we have for this debate. And one of the tough questions we hope to ask to our, uh, our uh, experienced distinguished uh, speakers is whether that assumption is, is right, because maybe explainability is not really a precondition for accountability. Maybe there are other tactics or other solutions that we should keep in mind. So that's definitely one of the issues we will try to cover. Um, another one is in which context AI explainability actually matters most and needs to be preserved as a principle then how to implement this principle in the context of very complex AI systems, especially machine learning uh, that change dynamically uh, over time, that get trained on data and uh, learn uh, them, themselves. Is it achievable from the technical perspective? Uh, 
finally, uh, I hope we managed to discuss expectations of affected individuals, expectations of other stakeholder groups who really needs to understand uh, AI systems, who needs access to information and who might not need that, but needs to be protected, needs to stay safe and have trust that there will be no harms. So this is the broad overview of what we hope to cover. Uh, there will be more, as I said, uh, definitely coming from our speakers um, uh, input and hopefully from, from our participants. Uh, Fanny? Great, so let me walk you through the session format really, really briefly. Um, first half of the session will be short interview style conversations with our great speakers. Uh, and then we'll transition into the, let's say a slightly more complicated part in the, in the discussion of the Q and A, uh, but uh, we're gonna manage the technology. I think it's quite easy. All we would like to ask you is to use the Q and A um, function, which is in the bottom of your screen, to ask any questions. Please feel free to use this function from the beginning. We will collect these questions and try to group them and come back to them later. In the meantime, you know that there's a chat function as well, but the organizers would like to ask all of you just to use the chat function for social interactions, sharing links, etc. But please keep the questions to the q and I hope it's visible. Uh, at the bottom. And um, if somebody wants to ask the question and speak, then please let us know in the chat and then we'll ask our kind uh, technical support colleagues to unmute specific participants so they are able to ask that question in the discussion part. That's all that needs to be known, I think, at the beginning. Kasia, is there anything else or? Can we jump in? Let me formally uh, welcome speakers that will um, will 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 talk in the first part of the session. We will introduce them through their projects as we jump into interviews. But you see their names. Uh, on the screen, uh, Tim Gerbro, uh, Google AI, Ethical AI Team, co-founder of Black in, an, in AI. Uh, welcome, Tim Uh Ruben Beans, Oxford University, previously uh, Information Commissioner's Office. Welcome, Ruben. Philip Dawson, Element, and, uh, Element AI, uh, as well as a fellow at the CAR Center for Technology and Human Rights. Welcome, Phil. And last but not least, Hong Q, AI blind spot previously YouTube. Okay, let's let's start the first interview. Thank you, uh, Timnit. I'd like to ask a few questions from you first, and it's my great honor to have this conversation with you here. We don't know each other in person, but you're one of my compasses on Twitter on this uh, awesome. subject and more. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to meet you here. And uh, as uh, Kasha mentioned, uh, you are a research scientist and a technical co-lead of Google, Google's ethical AI team. And um, well, I'm a human rights lawyer, but if uh, all the ethics, uh, ethics work were like what you are doing, then I would be less uh, anxious about seeing ethics conversations, uh, if I can start uh, with that. And so um, in July 2020, Google announced the introduction of uh, the model card toolkit for easier, easier uh, model transparency reporting. And this is based on a research that you've been doing for years now, and based on also a paper that I can only recommend people to read that was published in January 2019. And um, as you note in the paper, and this is where I'd like to start, there were no standardized documentation procedures to communicate the performance characteristics of trained machine learning and AI models. And this lack of documentation is especially problematic when models are used in applications that have serious impacts on people's lives, such as healthcare, employment, law enforcement, or education, all are as, uh, as um, prevalent and important as were when the, this paper was written. So this means that there was no proper evaluation of how these systems work or if they do at all. 
and uh, if they should be rolled out in the first place. So my first question is, what do you think of the accountability of these systems and people behind them? And what role does explainability play in this process, uh, in, in your opinion? And then we can dive into how the model cards hopefully, hopefully uh, help us in that objective. So, um, so I have to first say, I mean, you know, I'm not, uh, my expertise is not in explainability. So, so maybe I'm, uh, you know, I might not know the latest and greatest um, in that, in that realm, but I would say that even without, so there's a lot to be done on transparency and accountability, even when we don't have um, models that are explainable, like even if we're looking at them as a black box, I think. Um, there is a lot we can do, um, even when we don't have models that are uh, that are um, explainable. So, for example, um, like you were saying, uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's coming from my prior background as a as a hardware engineer and seeing like all of the different kinds of tests that are done, all of the edge cases, all of the you know um, characteristics that you try to look for in a device or something like that. And then when I was working in this field, um, basically seeing uh, just a standard training test set paradigm, and then you know people train on one set and then just test on another one. And then what happens is kind of after that whack-a-mole, right? Like that when they have like when there is you know one case that's escalated or something, somehow there is a fix for that case. When there's another case, there's a fix for that case, right? Um, whereas you know there isn't. Even in, in, in software testing, standard software testing, there is you know a lot of test cases that are generated to cover different edge cases and things like that. So um, currently, that's sort of what I'm focused on. So when we when we created model cards, what we thought, or maybe maybe Meg didn't think this, my co lead, but what I thought was, oh, you know, like people are all already doing all of these tests. It's just that they're not telling us. So what we want is for them to tell us what tests they're doing what kind of evaluation they've done before they release the models. But then we found that uh, they're not even, they're not doing this type of disaggregated testing that we asked for, for example, like, you know, um, have annotate your data by different characteristics and see how well your model performs for different groups of people, what it does for different groups of people. They weren't doing that. They weren't, you know, gathering um, evaluation data to do this. And so then I found, okay, well, well then it's not even that they're just, not telling us the test, they're not doing the test. So now we're kind of more focused in our team, at least, on what we call robustness, which is, well, I, I'm not even sure what, you know, a lot of people say the, the term robustness, but what we mean is, you know, kind of thinking about different test paradigms for di for different um, use cases and um, kind of creating a, a how-to model card. Like, how do you create a model card? How do you start what, what do you think about when you first start working on the model? And um, how do you think through, you know, unintended consequences and use cases? And how do you do also these like just tests where you don't even have to think about unintended, you know, a lot of engineers and scientists would say it's so hard for us to think about unintended um, cases, but there's tests that you can do where you do, you're not, when, even when you're not thinking about that. So that's sort of the kind of thing I'm thinking through that right now. Um, in terms of, well, I, I can't say too much about explainability given that that's not my area, but in terms of explainability, I also know that, you know, even some of the, um, the there are methods to, um, to, for of interpretability, I guess, not necessarily explainability, right? To, that are used on black box type models too. Um, so in computer vision, a lot of people use saliency maps or things like that. But then I know that people like Bing Kim had done this study that showed that all of these, um, that some of these uh, uh, saliency maps, for example, are not um, reliable. So, so like for example, what they do is, you know, if you want to say, and we, but we've used some of these. Um, I think in our test, in our robustness or test case scenario, they could help us, right? You can say, what is the model looking at most in the image or something like that. There's tools that help us do that, right? Um, and um, you know, what is the model being affected by most in the image? What is what is the what part of the image is affecting it most? But the thing is, those types of post hoc um, me me methodologies are not themselves that reliable. So it's it's kind of hard to see how you you know. I think people are working on making them more reliable. But yeah. 
Thank you. And um, well, there are two specific examples that you show in the paper uh, how a model card could and should look like. And one of them is a uh, system trained to detect smiling faces in images. And the other one is uh, to detect toxic comments in text. And um, so I was wondering why you, why you picked those two I don't even know if those are edge cases anymore because they are so yeah. uh, present in our lives. And and did the did the model cards? What what were the conclusions the model cards really showed and highlighted uh, on these models? So um, I think we chose in in some sense we chose these models because um, the well one of the one of the reasons was because the people working on them were so eager to work on model cards imagine you're at a company um and there's many different teams and you're you're telling them to do something extra with mod, like with model cards right nobody nobody has to do model cards it was kind of um, our research project that we were pushing forward at the time especially at the time i think now we're getting a lot more top down support to have more people work on model cards so at that time, and I had just joined Google actually. And so Meg was already working on doing this aggregated testing on smiling classifiers. So outside of model cards, she was already trying to, to look at these smile classifiers and the kinds of issues they were having. For example, um, she has another paper on adversarial uh, mitigating bias and smile classifiers. So what happens is that because a lot of these training data sets, they were more, they consisted of more women than um, than men, for example, and so they would uh, they would be more likely to classify women as um, smiling versus not, for instance. Um, and so then she came up with this methodology to um, uh, it, to mitigate this kind of issue in the model itself. So as she was testing, as she was working on disaggregated testing, she was already working with this type of smile classifier, right? And um, and then uh, in terms of toxicity. Um, you know, this is a huge issue because um, later on, even people from our team showed that when I talk about robustness, for example, um, this is the kind of stuff I would like to do now. I mean, I guess I'm working on more on future line of work and current research or current work. So Vinod in our team um, showed that some of these toxicity models, uh, when you change, if you have a sentence, that, and let's say I am a, I'm a man, I'm a person, and it has a, a particular toxicity score, and then you change, you know, or my name is X, it has a particular toxicity score. If you change X to be a different name, some other kind of name, then it, would, it will change the, the toxicity score, right? It'll be either less negative or more um, negative for certain kinds of names. And you know that shouldn't be the case. Um, be just based on names. And then other people in our team also showed that this similar type of um, uh, bias exists um, for people for disability status. So, you know, if, if you say I am a man, I am a mentally ill man, then the I have a mental illness or something like that, then the toxicity score would be much higher than it should be. So we could do a lot, a lot of these kinds of tests to see what types of biases that's the, the toxicity model has, right? And, and they're limited, but we could do these kinds of things. And this is the kind of stuff that you can show in a model card, right? So, so uh, it's hard because I think more transparency is good, even if your if your system is not is is it's not going to be perfect. It's going to be flawed in some way. And more transparency helps because you can say these are some of the issues we've seen with the system so that can tell you you know how you can and can, what how you should or shouldn't use it um, right it gives you a little bit more of an understanding of how what kind of issues you might might arise with this um, uh, sentiment score so toxicity classifiers are used for a number of things right they're used many times to like screen um, comments to see if they're you know if the comments should be taken down or something to screen for hate speech and a number of things online um, and that's the, just an aside, something that I'm personally worried about is how a lot of this kind of research is done in the English language. And so when you have hate speech online in many other languages, um, it's not really getting as much attention as it is in the English language. And of course that can have so many different kinds of issues. I don't know if I answered your question correctly, but yeah. Yes, thank you so much. And so I have one more question about the layered approach and but I want to pause for a second because I want to ask Kasha how we're doing with time. Can I still have this question or should we come back to this later? Because I know other 
other panelists will talk about. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think we are beyond the time. Uh, okay, we, we we'll come back to this. Interview. We'll come back to this later because I think others will touch on this uh, stakeholder specific and layered approach anyways. Thank you so much. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Fanny. Thank you, Timnit. I'm also looking at uh, the Q&A. Um, we will try to integrate those questions that fit the scope of the session. I'm not sure whether we will be able to cover those that don't, but well, let's see how we do with time. No big promises. I don't want to discourage anybody. Please share whatever you want to share. At least there is a value in all of us reading and seeing this, and I encourage also our speakers to look at the Q&A if you want to address some of the questions even not related to the explainability slash accountability uh, topic of the session, please do so. Uh, I will now uh, jump to my short uh, interview with uh, Ruben. Uh, Hi. Hello again. Um, thank you for, for, for being here. Uh, now you are uh, doing your research uh, at Oxford that was also I think your alma mater and the place where you did uh, very interesting um, experiments uh, before before your role at uh, information commissioner uh, office that uh, is actually the reason why how we met and how I thought that we should also meet in this uh, in this session while at ICO you were involved possibly even leading um, the work of the team that prepared a very useful practical guidance on AI uh, explainability. Um, and this is, uh, this is something that uh, I would like you to, 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 to draw from um, uh, in, this, in, this, in, this, in this short um, interview we have. Um, so based on this experience, uh, Essentially, do you think that uh, we should demand that all impactful AI systems are explainable or that standard should be safe for, 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 for some and not for, for every system? What would be the threshold or the red line or the guidance on explainability uh, from, from your insights uh, collected during, uh, during the work on the guidance? Sure. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so uh, I think um, one of the things that, that we found when doing that research was that um, a lot of the attention kind of in the computer science community and in the, also in the policy community, um, there was a, a sense that the thing that was needed to be explained was um, how uh, an AI system goes from a, a set of features for an individual case to a a decision or an output about that case. Um, and while that's obviously very important, and that's kind of uh, the work that Timnit was talking about relating to interpretability, um, I think what we realized was that was really just one small part of um, the bigger picture. And really transparency generally about all of the decisions that went into the design of the system, um, the kind of information that would be in like a model card um, or like uh, information about how the data was gathered and that kind of thing. That was equally, if not more important. Um, so we, 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 we tried to expand the notion of explanation to include those things as well. Um, and I think w where I would kind of come down on is I'd say, well, if, a, if a, a company or a government was using an AI system and it, it wasn't able to explain it to itself, so the people using the system weren't able to explain it to themselves, regardless of whether they could explain it to the individual that's affected by it. Um, that would be really worrying because it would indicate that they haven't done the work that they would need to do to satisfy themselves that are using a system that is, um, you know, not discriminating against people, that's robust, that's safe, um, and that doesn't have kind of unexpected failure modes that uh, that, they, that they haven't anticipated. Um, so I think. To answer your question, I guess I'd say um, I think they, sh you know, all systems that are, that are used that have um, kind of important impacts on society, and that could be uh, a really consequential decision for an individual, like whether they get a loan, but it could also be lots of little decisions that are made over the course of our lives, like uh, whether your posts on on social media get censored by a, a content filter, 
um, you know, they may be small, uh, small, lots of small decisions, but ultimately they add up to something quite significant. So yeah, I would say that that um, different kinds of explainability are important, but um, and that that should go across the across the the board of all the different systems that are being used. Um, but it it will obviously also depend on the context. It will depend on the type of system that's being used. A lot of the systems that uh, people talk about are are really um, kind of um, recent AI systems, which are you know making breakthroughs in kind of computer vision and things like that. But in reality, a lot of the systems that are being used and the, the systems that are being marketed um, are kind of uh, they might be called AI, but they might just be kind of very simple statistical models. Um, and so a lot of the discussion about AI, com complex AI that's unexplainable is often not relevant to a lot of the systems that are kind of actually being deployed in practice. Um, so for those kinds of things, I think um, often the, the, the uh, way that people talk about explainability is kind of missing the, the bigger picture. I have posted uh, uh, on the screen uh, examples of the, the, the types of explanations that uh, ICO includes uh, in the guidance that you worked uh, on. Uh, uh, I forgot to mention uh, that it was co-developed with Alan Turing Institute. Uh, and I do recommend everybody who hasn't seen it yet to, to go online to the ICO website and check uh, especially the practical part, uh, the explanation in practice. So just to just to summarize the point and for me to understand better, you wouldn't exclude even the most complex black box type of systems from uh, expectation of the explanation. It's rather the type of explanation we will um, argue for, but not uh, rather not a waiver on explanation because something is too complex to be explained. Yeah, is yeah, and I think, I think there are going to be cases where. Um, where there is a good use case for you know a deep learning model and um, that is going to have impacts um, and it is going to be difficult to explain the kinds of uh, the, the way that the system arrives at an answer about something because it's kind of the whole point of these systems is that they enable new kinds of abstractions that we as human beings can't really grasp um, but yeah I think even in those cases there are kinds of explanations which will be appropriate um, that will help uh, get yeah. the issues around um, governance and, and uh, the ethical impacts of these systems. And uh, as you already said, quite often or most often, it's not the technical complexity preventing explanations, but rather lack of political or commercial will to uncover uh, how the system functions. So something we would rather call the corporate or governmental black box and it piercing these black boxes does not require sophisticated legal uh, technical skills, but it does require a strong regulator, somebody who can knock at the door of the government agency or a corporate entity and actually demand uh, the information that can be revealed because there are no technical barriers, but uh, nobody there is willing to reveal them. Uh, what's your experience, based on your experience with the administration, are our regulators, at least in Europe, prepared to serve that function of being the ultimate auditor, the one who knocks on the door uh, and breaks open the corporate or governmental black box? Um, yeah, so I think I think there's there's a, a great deal of um, knowledge and skill in um, the different regulators in this space, either data protection regulators, you know, medical device regulators, and so on. Um, but definitely, there's room for improvement. There's room to um, bring new expertise in. Um, and uh, I think what, one thing we've we found when we were looking at it is that many organizations will say, well, we can't reveal that information because it's a commercial secret. Um, very often those arguments didn't um, seem to make that much sense when it comes to what information do you actually need to provide to satisfy someone that your system is performing well, um, not creating adverse uh, harm on different populations. Um, but even in the small number of cases where that could be an issue, I think the argument falls away when it's a regulator that's doing that because regulators routinely have to access commercially sensitive information and they have a clear democratic mandate to do so. Um, so I think provided that there's the right skills, the right um, expertise, uh, and also 
crucially the right political will to to back up um, the 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 scrutiny of these systems. Um, and I think there is growing kind of democratic um, mandate for that kind of work to happen. Mm -hmm. So that's about uh, the expert auditors. Uh, and now let's uh, close this short conversation, introductory conversation with users. Uh, I simply hate that term and I'm still using it. Uh, human beings affected by, uh, by AI uh, in your in your in your in your research at Oxford, one of the uh, studies you you performed uh, concerned uh, perceptions of fairness of AI systems based on what type of information uh, the affected individuals are given or what type of explanation they are given. Uh, I know this sort of research cannot be summarized in three sentences, but if there are any high level takeaways on on expectations of, of, of people affected by this system that you could share, um, what would yeah. be these insights? I mean, one of the things that, that really struck me from that research, which I wasn't expecting to find, was the extent to which when you, when you explain to people that the decision has been made and it's based on generalizations from you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of previous cases, um, even when it's, uh, you know, um, statistically robust and it's um, using a wide variety of features, people still have a kind of fundamental ethical problem with important decisions being made about them based on a generalization, a statistical generalization. Um, so that was one of the things we found is that when you explain pe to people how these things work, even if one explanation it kind of gives them more information that helps them understand how the system works. The fact that the, that, that decision is being made um, and on the basis of things that other people did, things that happened in the past, um, and they don't give them room for kind of individual justice or individual context to come into play. That's a kind of a fundamental objection that some people have to these kinds of systems. Thank you. So, so, so just having the system explained does not really solve uh, uh, that. That's that's not the first answer that people uh, expect when they have concerns about uh, fairness. That's probably not the default solution that we should be proposing for for the affected individuals. I'm sure we will talk more about how to then uh, how to then uh, ensure uh, fairness or accountability towards those who are most vulnerable and who have least time and skills to dig into explanations. Uh, I, I, I save that for, for the discussion part and uh, I'm ready to hand over back to Fanny for the third conversation. Thank you. Um, so our next uh, speaker is uh, Philip Dawson, who is the lead at Element AI, public policy lead at Element AI, but he also wears a few other hats for this conversation today. He also is a technology and human rights fellow at the CAR Center. He studies human rights implications of smart city projects, and he had a very specific experience in that uh, regard earlier this year. He led the independent human rights impact assessment of Alphabet's affiliate Sidewalk Labs digital proposals in the city of Toronto that probably many of you heard about this um, initiative. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's great to see you. And so my first question to you is that uh, the systems developed by Element AI are not that well known for consumers people, those human beings Kasha <laughs> mentioned. Um, but could you tell us uh, one or two examples where explainability um, had an important role in some of these systems that Element developed? And then in contrast to that, I'm really curious how you see this problem if, if um, the stakeholders involved in smart city projects, are they even thinking about the problems that might come up? Sure. Uh, thanks very much, Fanny and Kasha as well. It's, uh, it's, it's great to be with you on this virtual panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about some of the examples from Element AI's work. Um, in, so in addition to building um, uh, products uh, in our company and incorporating explain explainability features, 
We also have a dedicated explainability team that can that can be hired uh, on a consulting basis by other companies that are looking to improve their the, the performance of their explainability models or to develop completely new ones. And the two examples that I'm that I'd like to mention uh, briefly uh, are from some of those types of external engagements that our explainability team um, has taken on. So, um, and, and you know, some of this information you can see in the different white papers that are on our website on explainability. So feel free to uh, explore those uh, for a little bit more uh, detail. So, you know, at, at Element AI, we have experienced again and again that businesses really see uh, important business value from explainability. So, a little bit, a little bit like Ruben uh, was saying, uh, you know, there when you are developing a model or, or selling it to a client, uh, it's almost like the stakes of the, of the decision that are the, uh, the stakes of the decision don't really matter even as much as, as being able to explain to a customer why the model is doing something. I, I don't know if that was clear, but you don't really need, need any stakes. If you can't explain why the model is doing something, then you lose trust. Uh, and and a, and a client is 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 quickly much less interested. So you know, besides trust, um, explainability we found can can be important in de detecting bias. In some cases, particularly in financial services, uh, it's already part of regulatory compliance, um, and it can it improve it can actually improve performance of a model. So the first example that I want to share is from work we did with an auto parts manufacturer that wanted to automate quality inspection uh, using computer vision, okay? So uh, it was a, a visual anomaly detection system that offered pretty high performance, but still had occasional errors, about 1%. Uh, but that didn't matter to that customer's clients. They still wanted to know why uh, there were errors 1% of the time uh, with the model. So Element uh, worked with this uh, auto parts manufacturer to embed explainability components at each stage of the analysis. And I won't get into some of the details there, but ultimately that helped um, reduce by a factor of 10, uh, the occurrence of, uh, of false positives and improve the performance of the model and, and made this, this service uh, more robust. Um, so, you know, that, that's the first example. As Fanny mentioned, not particularly interesting for the public, but just, just good to be, uh, or, you know, for, for, you know, and it's not a B2C context, but it's, it's interesting to note that, you know, businesses are view this as valuable um, for their, to improve their service or products. The, the second example is from credit scoring, and we're getting a little bit closer to some of the issues that arise in smart city context, or that can. Um, and so, you know, assigning or denying credit is a, is a consequential decision that is well regulated to ensure fairness, respect for rights. Um, and uh, we had this kind of engagement recently where a bank needed to ensure its credit decisions were fair and explainable according to its local market uh, context and regulation. Um, the regulator had identified explainability and fairness as important AI principles, but there were, there were dozens of metrics for ensuring uh, fairness and explainability, and the bank needed to narrow down and justify their choices. So, so Element, uh, Element helped them um, to, to, uh, to basically, again, develop another explainability model to, to help them avoid um, uh, some perverse outcomes uh, that you've seen in other contexts. Uh, you know, lower thresholds that would cause higher default rates for protected groups um, and, and reveal bias and discrimination um, in, in the model. So, you know, these are some of the, the things I think people are most concerned about in the smart cities context uh, as well. Uh, you know, what type, how do we know uh, why decision about the allocation of public benefits? How do we know uh, you know, the rationale or the logic, and then how, how can we then better contest it? Do we have an, an opportunity to contest it and defend uh, potentially the violation uh, of, uh, of rights? So uh, I don't know if I, if I should st stop there, Fanny, or if uh, I, can, I can also go on. No, thank you. This was uh, great to start with. Um, the continuing uh, along those lines, uh, 
is you started to mention different tools and we already touched on this question of, yes, it has to be contestable as well and other, many other questions to be answered. In, in a complex situation, complex both from, let's say, an AI model perspective, but also from the interaction perspective, like in a smart city where there's a lot of different services and, and digital tools that you can face. I'm wondering if we say that, okay, AI explainability is one of the end goals that we want to achieve, but what are, what are the tools that can support, what can, what can we do not before, but let's say while we are getting to that end goal. That's a great question. I mean, I think it depends. I think it depends who you are. I think we see from a, a government or local governments or regulators perspective, there are already things that you can do to help pave the way to uh, for to, to ensure that you know future deployment or integration of automated decision making systems or AI systems. Uh, are transparent and, and explainable. Uh, in the smart city context, uh, you know, there was the example of Waterfront Toronto, which commissioned this human rights impact assessment, which had a strong emphasis, obviously, on transparency, accountability, and explainability of AI systems. And that particular project, there, there were no digital solutions developed yet, so it was very much uh, a desk research exercise. But it, it really, really highlighted the, uh, the priority that uh, was being given uh, to explainability um as well um and then you know we, there's there's been a number number of other uh requests for proposals that uh, have come out since then including from hong kong which recently requested consult consultancy services to develop a practice guide or risk management framework to support the ethical adoption of ai and in which uh transparency traceability explainability of algorithms um uh was a was a core element um and this was really seen by the, by the government, at least in the RFP, as, a, as a, a necessary step to enable the city's smart city blueprint, which included over 70 di proposed digital innovations. So, you know, whether we're talking about private sector or public sector, including local governments, it's, it's clear that, uh, that it, people are seeing accountability and explainability as prerequisites to large scale deployments. Um, in, in the waterfront uh, Toronto example, which, where I have a little bit more experience, we, we, we participate in different pu public consultations and we did about 75 um, individual consultations with experts and stakeholders. Um, I would say that uh, few people were, were thinking about explainability itself. Uh, there was a there were a whole lot more questions about the transparency of the, uh, of the use of digital solutions or how uh, whether and how automated decision making systems would be used to inform policy or the or, or service delivery. Um, and again, I just reiterate that, you know, the project wasn't in operation. So uh, that may explain some of the focus, but the people seem to be, still be more concerned about the transparency, even of earlier things like the use of data, what data is being collected, how do I know, what is it being used for, who is it being given to, who can I ask? Um, you know, those are still questions I think I've found people are focusing on more um, than, you know, interrogating the model. Uh, uh, and I think we also forget that uh, we sometimes forget in conversations about explainability or accountability of AI systems that there's a lot we can do um, outside of the model to prepare different processes um, and, and, and institutions for those types of questions. Uh, whether they're complaints or whether it's oversight or just greater transparency about how these systems are uh, are are deployed uh, and, and for what and and what are the expectations. So I think, yeah, it, as explainability and an element, we see explainability as a, an evolving but still relatively immature field, um, and mainly for AI practitioners. Um, uh, you know, I think there's a lot that we need to be doing outside of um, explainability research um, and modeling to to help uh, kind of prepare the way. And I, I realize I may have gone a little bit over, so I'll, I'll just stop there and wait for the discussion. Thank you. I think it's um, quite interesting also how these um, certain elements of, let's say, a human rights impact assessment, whether it's mandatory or not, whether it's made public or not, mm -hmm. or a public registry, 
or the data protection components, or for instance, somebody raised this question and we can come back to this later about how, what, how is or was already um, this uh, regulatory um, requirement in the, in the financial service that you, that you mentioned. Um, and I think in the discussion, we will probably touch on these solutions. As, I mean, it's definitely high on cashes and my list to advocate for, for these things to get into legislative and regulatory processes. Um, thank you. Um, all right, Kasha, should, should we pause yes. and then? Yes, all right. Thank you for handing over to me. Uh, it's just to say that we have seen the questions directed uh, at Phil in the Q&A. Phil, please take a look and I do hope we will be able to cover them uh, soon because soon we are approaching second part of the session, but still in the first round, uh, I want to interview Hong. Uh, who is uh, working uh, on a, a very interesting project and has a super relevant experience talking about accountability of algorithms because um, Hong, you started your, uh, I understand it was also early days of your career, not only early days of YouTube, you started your career at, uh, at YouTube, uh, watching product design for one of the more sophisticated algorithmic machines that we have uh, online. And I understand you are not uh, very happy with what you have seen um, uh, on the corporate side, because recently you co-founded um, AI Blindspot, which is a critical project. Um, the way you, you explain it uh, is that this is a discovery process meant for uh, meant for those uh, who want to challenge unfair AI systems. Um, you collaborate with activists, advocates, uh, vendors and policymakers who want to keep accountable uh, those who design AI, but also the same discovery process can be used, I understand, by those who design uh, AI systems if they want to get it right, if they want to spot their own blind spots, uh, as you frame it, if they want to prevent biases. Um, I wish everybody was doing it. I know there is not always a will to do so, but I wonder based on your experience, both at YouTube and, and in your project and maybe other places, uh, is it realistic, is it possible at all that all blind spots, all potential risks related to AI systems are spotted, even if you try? Thank you, Kasia. And I really um, am honored to have this opportunity to share my first personal experiences working on YouTube, but also my current work with a team of co-founders on AI Blindspot. So I'll start off with, in 2006, about 15 years ago, I joined YouTube as one of their first product designers. And the mantra there in the early days of uh, any startup is, uh, don't ask for permission, but ask for forgiveness. And that's the way to get things done. Um, the other mantra is think about the lifetime value of your user base and prioritize the highest value. Uh, so those two guiding principles for industry and professional, they might have become less stringent and less of a uh, issue now that there's ethical uh, issues around that, but I want to frame that that was what's happening. And, and this is a spectrum that's changing slowly. Um, I looked at the election just last yesterday and there was a YouTube channel that was providing fake live stream results, completely made up maps of who's winning. And that got seen by thousands, tens of thousands of YouTubers. I think that's unacceptable. Um, if I was sitting on YouTube side as an engineer, I think they cached it very quickly. This is my assumption that by just highlighting and whitelisting a couple of fake sites like CNN and USA Today and removing all the non fake news sites. And so they didn't anticipate it. They failed in this way, in a big way for those thousands of disenfranchised users. So these type of, I call it emerging risk or abusability. Um, I think that's uh, the unknown unknowns are incredibly complex. I'm doing a PhD in network science and emerging complex systems where you don't have a linear cause and effect where you have nonlinear cause and effect. So I, I myself, both have to um, learn the technical aspects uh, and also the ethical aspects. So that brings me to the ethical issue. I'll provide a very uh, specific example of a research project I'm doing at Stanford right now 
as a fellow in the civil society, digital civil society lab at Stanford. I'm looking at also this issue of uh, access to credit for the marginalized uh, communities. And I think the myth is that if you can technically solve all the uh, uh, technical issues of bias and discrimination, you're okay, your job is done. With AI blind spot, we're pointing out that this, the most important blind spot is the purpose of the system. How are you distributing the benefits of AI equitably? And what success criteria? I think Tim uh, uh, noted this in the chat. What values have you already assumed in the encoding and the, the purpose and the goals of the system? And how do you measure that? So when I think about explainability, I think there's the local explainability of individual decisions, Let's say I, as an individual, apply for a mortgage and I get rejected. At that point, that's the moment where I need to understand why and what can I do about it? What's my remedy? Um, on the global level, I think experts should, like NIST or other technical experts and regulators should have access, should have the data. So there's two different aspects of it. But in order to protect the fundamental rights to access credit, which the laws are in the book, there's fair lending laws, and to really make it a reality, I think the uh, uh, engineers and the product teams have to keep in mind there's historical inequalities that the code cannot remove. For example, in 2007, 2006, the subprime crisis, minorities were steered to these really uh, high-risk products, which they might have defaulted on. And as a result, if you take that data as your training data, you're still gonna bias the minorities. Uh, and that's not because of the technical glitch, that's the question of what ethical framework and what trade-offs are you making? So that's a concrete example and I hope to publish that report early next year to share with you all. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Um, uh, let me uh, go deeper in what you also mentioned um, uh, in, in, in your, in your uh, current project. Uh, the idea of a human-centered design uh, approach. Uh, I wonder uh, how in practice uh, can we, apart from revealing the purpose of the system, I totally, I can't agree more that this is usually the, the most striking blind spot in the whole design process and in communication also with, um, with uh, end users. But uh, what else can we do to empower people so they can interrogate challenge uh, these systems and uh, maybe even co-decide on how these systems impact uh, uh, them. Uh, is it, should that be um, uh, a form of communication like information revealed to users or you have other techniques, other design techniques in mind that might be more, more, more impactful than just giving people more information? That's a great question. I think about this a lot because my training and background as a product designer is very user focused. Now, instead of focusing on the high lifetime value, I'm thinking about uh, what kind of social services, what kind of community social uh, organizations should I work with to ensure complete protection of the fundamental rights. So uh, the first response in, in regarding this is that if, the, if it's not community led and if the marginalized communities don't have any true authority to influence or maybe even make some of these decisions that the product that's embedded in the products, then I think it's very difficult for them to participate. So there's a whole movement called participatory ML AI that's fermenting and I think it will be very powerful. The other point I would make is that if there's a pattern of discrimination, there should be a way to, to register these complaints. For example, by, on Twitter, there was a case where an entrepreneur uh, realized he applied for the same Apple credit card as his wife. His wife makes more money, but she got a lower credit limit. That's a way to complain. So we have to formalize these kind of disclosures, these kind of monitoring systems. So we identify the patterns early and quickly. And finally, I was listening to a lecture by Andrew In, uh, and he proposed this notion of like a kind of like a shadow deployment where you have the experts who used to make these decisions and you deploy the system and you compare the decisions of the experts, the humans with the AI and there's discrepancies. It's the responsibility of the team, the technology team to try to uh, con converge and try to fix those. So all this is really to say that um, 
everyone should have a stake, but right now the power and the kind of opacity and also the data is proprietary and the properties in the hands and properties of the companies. So I will hope to have greater scrutiny of both the provenance, which was a question in the discussion, the provenance, are you compulsory, doing compulsory inclusion and also the governance of the data. So, so do I get it right from what you just said that the practical value of explainability is limited and uh, the inclusion should happen uh, in the design process that there are more meaningful tactics, so to say, to include people than through explaining them the functionality of the system, right? I feel challenging on the local level, the explainability might help in one case, but if you want to challenge the whole system and improve the entire purpose of this product and this AI for the benefit of everyone. And I think there's a lot of potential to uh, fix these on the system level. And in order to do that, it should be community led and the whole blind spot system really lets you start at the very first stage of consultation and purpose and defining all these values so that the technical work follows from there and the risk management uh, and abusability work also is aligned in the trade-offs that's being made it's also explained from an ethical perspective. Yeah, I'm just uh, worried that uh, including people in the design process is even more challenging thing to ask from companies and governments than uh, pushing them on explainability, which at least gives something to us experts to fight, uh, fight for. Uh, like explainability can be a very interesting tactic for for experts, for watchdog organizations, for activists to uncover what's wrong with the system and fight against it. But uh, other than that, uh, yeah, I'm just worried that the more we demand, the less we, we might get from those who have power. Um, thank you for sharing these insights. Uh, with, 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 with this last uh, introductory interview, we uh, are ready to start uh, open discussion. And uh, obviously we see uh, questions that pop up in the Q&A part. I hope all the speakers see them and especially Phil will be able to address those two questions that are, that are directly to him. Um, Phil, are you ready to do it now or should sure. we? Yeah, sure. okay. I, I, I did, uh, I, I did, I typed out uh, kind of in, in the interest of time, I also typed out some answers to these questions. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, I, still, I haven't seen that. That's all right. So feel free, every, you know, every, anyone who's interested to just see the link that I put into the chat, and and I also provided an answer on the uh, on the regulation in question. So I hope I hope that helps. Okay. If there are follow up questions, uh, do let us know. This is time for you. I mean, for all the participants. Uh, there is an interesting comment question um, uh, in the Q and A that I would like to the two of them I would like to quote uh, to tease out uh, more discussion with our uh, speakers. One is human intervention issue. We uh, discussed, we touched on the explainability, on its limitations, and uh, even on the argument that it's not always the most desirable tactic. But there is one more layer added by European law that not only requires uh, explanation, but also requires human intervention. Uh, um, that's according to the GDPR, the right of an individual who is affected by, uh, in a significant way by the system. Many of you used significant examples like credit scoring um, uh, decisions. So how to ensure that this right to human intervention can be exercised in practice when decision is made by machine uh, and the logic behind this operation is non-transparent, not understandable, even for data controllers. What do we do with cases like this? Is it an example of the red line simply imposed by the European law? Uh, should we say that systems that have the significant impact on humans uh, cannot be black boxes to the extent uh, that they would not allow for human intervention? Robin, I see you nodding. Maybe you want to quickly comment, but then everybody else as well. Uh, sure. So I think um, it, the, the point of, of Article 22 is to avoid the kind of situation I was talking about before that the participants in our study uh, objected to, which was the idea that something important could be decided about their lives uh, without them being able to have any kind of contextual judgment about their individual case. 
Um, and so I think there is definitely an important role for um, human intervention. Um, and I think the, the safeguards around that in Article 22, so if you have, um, if you are using AI in a solely automated manner that has legal or similarly significant effects on people, and, and you have a, um, a lawful basis, which is allowed under Article 22, you still need to put in place all of these safeguards. And I think the safeguards shouldn't be just understood as like a, a list of different things that are individually useful or nice to have. They actually should be understood as supporting each other. So the right to um, obtain a human intervention in the decision is related to the right to put forward your own view about why you maybe shouldn't be treated in that way by an algorithm. And similarly, um, you know, the, the stuff around explanation relates to that as well. The, the reason why we want explanations is to facilitate that same process. So all of the safeguards um, kind of mutually support each other. Um, so that's why I kind of, uh, I feel like um, it's important to, to not just think of them as individual different safeguards, but they're all part of the same, uh, protecting the same fundamental um, concern about uh, individual decisions. What, sorry, Kasha, you can... sorry, uh, uh, Timnit, would you like to add something uh, or I misinterpret your body language? Oh, I, I wasn't, I don't have to add anything mm -hmm. to this one. Sure. Yeah, anybody else on the human intervention um, aspect? Or should I bring the other comment? May I have I a mean, first follow up? Sorry, please. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was, I can, you know, say something. I think that this human intervention aspect is important. Um, even if we don't have, like I was saying, even if it's a, a black box, uh, because there are many things that could happen. Well, I, I'm seeing many, um, right now, I'm seeing a lot of uh, things that are deployed where, uh, that, where the other humans that are interacting with the things that are deployed don't really know that there's some sort of stuff going on. Like, for example, there are tools that are used for hiring where the, the interviewees are being recorded on camera, being given these like two minute standardized tests. And they're like, these tests are meant to um, kind of test their personality or something like this. Like, like I was asking people, what kind of questions are you getting? They're like, Disc you know, if, if you found out that someone was cheating on an exam, what would you do? And then r while they're being um, asked these questions, then there's also emotion detection that's being applied to their faces, which they don't know anything about. And then who knows what kind of bundle, what kind of scoring system or whatever is being used on them that's bundled up to determine whether they should get jobs or not, for example, right? And so, uh, <laughs> so, but, but I think it's complex to, you know, what does human intervention mean? People can say, oh, I pushed the button, so it's human intervention. It's human in the loop, like, you know, and um, I was reading an article by this uh, um uh, doctor, I forgot his name, and I, I, I cite it in uh, the book, a book chapter that I wrote. And he was, he was giving the example of a spell checker, you know, so at some point, you know, you, you write, you make sure your, your spellings are the same and whatever. But then at, at another point, like at least I get so used to autocorrect spell checker that yes, I'm not paying attention. And so he, he gave the example of they are, like they apostrophe re versus their. And like a lot of times, you know, you, you, the spell checker will give you one or the other and you don't necessarily notice it becomes secondhand and you just work on it. Right. And so he was like, is that what is that what we're starting to do in medicine and healthcare? Is that what we're going to do? We should make sure that this is not how we interact with the system and trust it so much. And so we call this automation bias. Right. Trust the automated system so much, even as experts. Right. Um, that when we're interacting with it, we just sort of uh, don't have any sort of oversight. So I think I, I think this human intervention aspect is important, but I also think that it's like how to make it. I I, I, I think there might need to be more specificity of like what that what that means. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Fanny. Um, there was a. 
question, not framed directly this way, but I think it's related uh, to this human intervention. What is a meaningful one about content moderation? There's this question. Yes. That, and so I was thinking to transition to that a little bit. Uh, let me, yeah, uh, full agreement uh, on this. Let me only uh, reinforce uh, as a European lawyer uh, that probably uh, the way to interpret GDPR uh, uh, in the context of black box systems is to simply prohibit the use of systems that do not allow for meaningful human intervention and do not allow for any sort of explanation in the context when the impact on the individual is significant. That would be my response, like the most straightforward response. Uh, and just a one side note on what Timnit said about human um, system uh, interaction. Uh, I do think that this is just the, the, the biggest, the most challenging area for research in psychology opening right now, how to ensure that we humans are able to have uh, that oversight. And I, I could also quote many interesting studies, including recent Polish study from Poznań. Uh, I will make sure the link uh, uh, shows up somewhere uh, where a psychologist studied how humans uh, follow um, clearly uh, ridiculous recommendations of AI systems and they do follow them even when they think themselves that these are ridiculous rec recommendations. So I think we have a lot to study and look at in how to ensure that human intervention is a meaningful form of supervision. So that was just my, me adding to this question and uh, Fanny, uh, please go on with the content moderation question. And uh, I mean, this question can also lead maybe later coming back to prohibitions because we want to ask all of you a little bit about your opinion on bans and prohibition. But let's let's start with the with the audience uh, question then. Um, so it uh, it literally says, what role do you see regulators playing in AI explainability and accountability for content moderation recommendation? Is it? Is it desirable? And I just wanted to frame it uh, also in the context that it, it's quite challenging in a legal perspective as well, because freedom of opinion, unlike freedom of expression, is an absolute right. And uh, so the interference with freedom of opinion is a much, uh, much more difficult, uh, difficult uh, legal exercise to, to justify, if at all. And I don't think we will solve uh, platform governance in this five minutes right now. But, um, but uh, we are wondering, based on this question, and already touched on on YouTube and and content rec open recommendation systems what do you think is missing from the regulatory side uh, I could follow up on my YouTube experience one very late night when I was working still on YouTube in the early days we were creating the related videos and we asked ourselves should we we label as suggested videos because we're so confident about our recommendations and we said no 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 we can't suggest videos to you because that's too uh, too much of a uh, you know being uh, pushing things to you so we end up leaving out these later videos so that's really one example of how uh, within the platforms uh, they're kind of treading this fine line uh, in terms of solutions i think i have two possible ideas i think throughout the you know development of the industry the surveillance capitalism the notion that the data, your data belongs to the company and they can do what they will to target you. And it's very difficult to opt out of the targeting, whether for ads or for content recommendations. That might, if we enable more user control and more interoperability so that users can switch out, uh, uh, that, that might uh, create some new incentives in the marketplace. Uh, the second uh, idea is that if the, uh, if the recommendations are harmful to anyone, not just the paying customers and the lifetime value, uh, the, the regulators can enforce and the rights and the uh, ability for recourse and compensation. So I think that those two might uh, create some disincentives for uh, you know, not managing this very closely and very well and not disclosing how they're going about. I, I could, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, so 
I'm a paid speech and content moderation is really not my area, but I'm starting to get extremely worried about it right now because um, I'm originally from Ethiopia, for example, and um, there's a lot of uh, hate speech. Uh, there's just a lot of misinformation, disinformation, a lot of stuff that's going on online, which is really not being addressed by any of the social media companies. Um, uh, in my opinion, I don't know much about what's going on at YouTube, but literally like all of them. And uh, one of my friends, he's a Moroccan researcher and he used to be a journalist. And by necessity, he has been tracking down this network of uh, stuff that's happening. And what he was telling me is that a lot of people are doing research on just uh, bots or what's happening online or something like that but they're not really kind of looking at the interaction between, you know, the entities that are trying to get this stuff uh, done and the bots and the real people. And like, it's, it's a much more complex interaction, right? For example, so he was giving an example of this Moroccan uh, uh, journalist in the US and how she was trying to uncover some of the, some things that were happening. Um, and the moment that she um, tweeted about it, there was another person who was being paid by the entities who are trying to harass a, um, a journalist. The moment that person responded on Twitter, then all these bots started attacking um, the person in question. So he uncovered all of this network of things that were happening. So it's it's a combination of bots and people, but it's it's still related to the geopolitical situation that's happening in the country, right? But what's going on is that because everybody's so focused on the U.S. election, he couldn't get anybody at Twitter to, 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 you know, do anything about it because it's a small team. It's a small safety team. They can't do They don't care about Morocco right now. They care about what's happening in the U.S., right? But that's not acceptable because it's uh, these um, companies are all operating in, 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 you know, all over the world. So it's, I'm worried about a similar thing that's happening in Ethiopia. So one of my friends is working on what we what she calls context specific content moderation for African countries. Right. There was this article that talked about how Facebook didn't even have an office there until until tw um, 2015. Right. So all of these countries that are not considered important by um a lot of the tech companies, well, one of the ones I'm working in even, um, and um, this, because imagine the amount of resources you have to put in to, to, to really do, um, especially in Ethiopia, there's so many languages, for example, you know, so many languages, so many points of view, and so content moderation that accounts for each of these things. And so a lot of times it seems that it's when it becomes a, a high PR sort of priority that people pay attention to it, right? And so how do you make sure that um, all of these countries that have many people that are using these platforms are not left behind um, because they're not considered a priority. Mm -hmm. I think increasing challenge with content moderation is the volume of it. it. It will never get smaller. So even assuming the best will on the side of, of platforms or even assuming the most rigid law forcing them to ensure human intervention is just probably not going to, to be, be feasible. But yeah, that's just uh, some skepticism. Before we transition, may I just add one note because we have these um, AI policy conversations and and you are the people who are doing the actual detailed research and different type of work on this but many conference rooms are still very high level policy oriented blah blah on AI and in the meantime regulators are actually writing certain type of automation into law as we speak and the European Union, for instance, because of very false political impetus using terrorist attacks as a justification to rush through legislation, they are now adopting the so-called terrorist content regulation, where they will put a legal standard for these social media companies to proactively use these automated tools uh, that will fully ignore these contextual realities or languages or even the legality of a content um so yes sorry that's that, that's my <laughs> my pet peeve on this right now yeah, no no content moderation is really something we, we won't solve today uh, it's probably the area where we are just doomed to to deal with very bitter compromises 
uh, and the only way of escaping problems caused by this would be not to do it. But that's that's something I would say for a different panel. Uh, for this one, uh, I'm I'm watching the time. I would like to combine maybe two very interesting comments we have in the Q and A, encouraging uh, another round of of comments from the speakers. Um, one uh, is uh, is bringing the context of credit scoring. So while for content moderation, it, it might be super difficult to imagine human oversight for credit scoring, we do uh, expect it. And, but the question here is about algorithms that are used for interpreting credit scoring applications. If any of you could comment on, on what types of algorithms uh, are used for this purpose and whether that's also a way to go, uh, a, a way to um, establish some form of interpretability interpretability without engaging humans. I would encourage comments on this. And another uh, interesting comment is in response to what Robin said, uh, let me read it. I wonder what the panelists have to say about what we could call dodgy inferences when systems infer things about people that are based on scientifically flawed premises, like inferring uh, emotion from facial configurations or extremely problematic things like criminality inferred from analyzing photos of people. Does explainability offer a good way to oppose such inferences? So uh, the floor is yours. Whoever wants to comment, please unmute yourselves. Um, I have stuff to say that I wanted to. Okay, go ahead. Go I was going to say I want to nominate. <laughs> no, go ahead. I, I'll, I'll. We have time. Okay, I was I was just going to make a brief comment, uh, and uh, maybe also curious to hear how how Ruben and others respond to that question, that last question. But I think it is it's a it's a really good point, and I think it, it may be uh, tying back to what Fanny said earlier. The uh, an area where where clear prohibitions or at least guidance on uh, on, exp on the role of explainability in certain contexts can be further developed. Um, but I, and maybe this is a bit of a question. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if, if it already does cover um, some of those uh, points that I, I, I believe were raised in the, in the question about, um, you know, if you can rely scientifically dubious uh, maybe I guess maybe it's not science. We're, we're already prohibiting, uh, you know, discrimination, um, discrimination. But maybe there is no, no, there is no scientifically kind of dubious category. But sometimes a scientifically dubious category, like I don't know, uh, appearance, is closely linked to a protected uh, a class under discrimination. I'm not, I can't think of an example. Example, and I'm rambling a little bit, but I think it's a really it's a really good point. We, um, uh, I guess I'm, I'm, and I'm trying to think about what it would be another scientifically dubious example, uh, emotions, uh, sentiment, appearance. Uh, maybe, maybe that's an area for a, a more a clear prohibition uh, and, and maybe even a general prohibition outside the context where it relates specifically to rights or to a significant uh, effect on someone's well-being or health or or financial status. It's uh, it's uh, it kind of goes more to arbitrariness um, than than anything else, with maybe incidental impacts on rights. Anyway, some 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 disorganized thoughts, but I think it's a really good point. Yeah, I was going to say that um, you know many of these things that are coming up um, don't pass the smell test, right? So I just signed like how many letters against how many papers that were about to be published or some were taken down from these very high profile journals, but others were still up there. So there's this paper on, you know, like for example, recently there was this paper on analyzing um, someone's perceived trustworthiness and how it it is related to their face across time, right? And so then they have this figure that clearly shows like if the more African features you have, the less trustworthy you are, whatever. We don't need explainability to show that this is completely wrong, right? You know, because like what even, or people trying to um, have correlations between race and certain things. The field of critical race theory has already is already kind of addressing some of these things. But the problem is this is not even about you know, a lot of times the technologists themselves who are the people 
kind of tasked with coming up with explainability solutions are the ones making these mistakes and, and working on these fields, right? Um, so for example, Steven Pinker at Harvard is working on like race science and all sorts of stuff that um, talks about how, you know, certain races are more uh, smarter or like things like I don't know, um, you know, the different sexes and stuff. I, I write about this in my book chapter on AI ethics. Um, so it's on Oxford um, uh, Handbook of AI Ethics on Race and Gender. And so this data driven, the best scientists have always been doing this kind of stuff, right? So Charles Darwin is one example where he talks about in, in his book, The Descent of Man, he talks about how women's skulls are like smaller than men's skulls and things like this, right? So a lot of the, the, the need to use data. So he was still trying to measure things and create a, a, and come up with conclusions based on data. So this kind of need to come up with data driven solutions. And then people have also done this thing. A lot of people do this study where they say, oh, the IQ distributions of men, men ha are usually, you know, women's uh, IQ distributions are like more, they have less of a variance, whereas men's have more of a variance. And so therefore the highest IQ people are also men, the lowest, you know, it's like a never ending thing that this happens. And so I, I sort of feel my gut feeling is that it's a, it's a lot more basic than needing some of these um, uh, tools to, to get us out of this. It's more like there are a lot of disciplines and people who already know that this is wrong, except they don't have power. They don't have to be listened to. Um, and so people just go off and do this kind of stuff. And hopefully now I feel um, you know, people who would uh, advocate for not doing this kind of stuff are being more listened to. I am sorry for the rant, but this is, this is really such a <laughs> something that really gets to me. Um, yes, I'm gonna write uh, the chapter here. Uh, but sorry, guys. Yeah, I'm I'm kind of done with my rant. I thought Robert wanted to address this question as well, right? Um. Yeah, fantastic rant. I think uh, uh, I completely agree with everything that was just said. Um, and I think one of the problems is that computer science has been kind of used as a backdoor to resurrect a lot of these really pseudoscientific ideas. Um, and I think that's something that uh, you know I'd really want to work on with my peers is to is to kind of recognise when that's going on and call it out. Um, because it, it, the, the whole, um, when, when there's a huge demand, um, for systems that do something that is impossible or that is based on completely, uh, flawed, uh, pseudoscientific notions, there'll always be a market for it. And there will always be demand for people to create a system that does X, even if X is completely discredited in science. And so um, I think, you know, in computer science and in technical disciplines, we really need to kind of be much more aware of that and much more ready to, to call out the, the bullshit on that. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's super important. Um, and it goes it goes right through to the whole way we um, we think about uh, statistics and um, the way we uh, create labels, the way we treat features in data sets as kind of given rather than constructed. Um, so all of those things, I think, are really critical for um, changing how uh, computer scientists, machine learning people, engineers engage with these issues. Um, but yeah, that's all I can really add to that. Oh, thank you, Ruben. If I may, I can give a very clear, even non-AI example. In the US election, uh, the labels from the positionality of statistics of Hispanics in the US was just one monolithic vote. And that caused a lot of issues, especially in Florida in predicting that. So if, I used to work in a news organization. So if these news organizations and polling firms are throwing hundreds of millions of dollars and can't figure the simple thing out, I don't have too much confidence in the math behind data. And I think one conclusion is easily based on this that it's it's a no no brainer to say that the pub public sector actor should be prohibited from procuring any of these technologies, and it, the burden of proof should be on them 
and the, per, the or organization trying to enter into contract with the public sector entity to prove that it works and it's not the other way around it's not us who should go to court or yes we should call out the, the bullshit i fully agree but i think the the owner should be on the other side Uh, we have five minutes left. I think we have uh, done justice to all the comments and questions in the Q&A. At that point, I do not encourage new ones uh, just out of fear that we won't be able to handle them, but this is a perfect time to give uh, our speakers the chance to uh, send your uh, final message or summarize your main point uh, or do a short rant if you still have to do one. Uh, Let's do this quick round of, of closing statements, okay? Uh, Hong, would you like to start? Thank you, dear. yes. Um, so uh, I'd like to thank everyone and I really appreciate all the great ideas and I think we all got a lot from this panel. Myself, in my career, I jumped around from uh, high tech to journalism to academia and I, I realized that uh, the field is changing rapidly. There's a lot of need for ethics in AI and to combine the skills of social scientists, uh, humanists, as well as technologists. So I would leave you with this. I, I believe that it's not a single like silver bullet answer. We really have to work together. We have to uh, monitor and be able to have oversight uh, and advocate for the uh, interests of and protect the uh, basic rights and data rights of all the marginalized communities around the world to ensure equitable benefits. Uh, and if that's the starting point, maybe we'll start moving in the right direction with the technology. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Phil? Sure. Um, I will, I'll end just very briefly just to say that uh, at Element AI, we, we routinely see that uh, clients of ours see uh, explainability as bringing critical value to their businesses, uh, you know, beyond questions of rights, even in credit scoring, but in, in just the performance of models, it can be an essential tool um, and it, it helps build trust and, and even more importantly, uh, it protects credibility. Uh, of of your uh, of your products and services, so uh, it, it's it's something that is critical to uh, success uh, from a corp from a corporate standpoint, um, and also it, it it bumps up against risks that we see more in the public domain, whether we're talking about content moderation or or life in in smart cities um, and, and what that might look like. I think uh, what I would say, based on my experience at Elements and in 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 applying that to some of the research I'm doing on smart cities is that the the I think the relative immaturity of the field uh, should make us even more cautious um, when we're depending on what types of uh, digital services we're considering in 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 uh, uh, for deployment internally in governments or in municipalities uh, in service delivery um, and because of approaches, because the approaches to explainability are immature, but also because ultimately the end user is people who need to be able to understand and then take actions based on these explanations, I don't think are, are really uh, grappling with these issues yet. Um, and they're an essential part of the, of the kind of collaborative process of, of developing an appropriate explainability technique. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much uh, for having me. I learned a lot from, from the other panelists and from, from both of you too. Tamnit, would you like to go now? Uh, sure, yes, I was, I, mean, I don't really have that much to add um, and that I agree that it's not a silver bullet. And I think that this, this kind of issue requires people from many disciplines to, uh, work on so in our team we just hired um, our first social scientists which I'm, I'm excited about um, and uh, oh I'm, I'm distracted by the chat participatory approaches yes um, and um, and I think at least for my work I've seen people from all uh, walks so whether it's from civil society journalists um, uh, human rights lawyers um, uh, they, um, there is like an outside inside dynamic that I think is very, very important because the journalists help us 
like if you're in a company and people don't take you seriously, the journal is highlighting some of this stuff helps us make sure that like the work, you know, the, the corporations are also held accountable, right? So th for those people in the inside, this helps. Um, and so I think there's a, a part that everybody um, has to play to figure some of this out. Thank you, Robert, you have the last word. Um, yeah, so I, I think uh, th thanks thanks for having me. It's been a really interesting chat, um, and uh, I think the, the the best kind of the best case scenario, I guess, for explainability is that um, it's it's proportional to power. So the more power you have, the more transparent you need to be, um, and hopefully that can also lead to kind of challenging. Uh, damaging systems that, that, that harm people in in, um, in in new ways and hopefully it can play a role in kind of uh, pointing out cases where AI is being put forward to to solve things that it can't solve um, and so that that would be my hope for for explainability that that's where the the the, the efforts in this space uh, that's the direction they go in in future Thank you all very much, Kasha. Um, I think we are right on time to close this session. So thanks for all the speakers and thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, the two of us are thanking you as well. Uh, and yes, please follow us for more information. Check our, our Twitter feed and uh, websites. If you want to understand better the work of our organizations, I can only say I wish we had the three hours we initially planned for the workshop during the IGF to explore what we couldn't explore today. But what happened was, was also for me extremely insightful. So thank you all for doing the best we could have done in this online environment. And see you somewhere else, maybe live at some point. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.